This, many would say, is the age of science. It's widely assumed that science alone holds the key to truth and objective knowledge, as at last mankind is free from the irrational hold of religion, myth and superstition. After all, science seems to be built upon reason rather than impressions, feelings or tradition. And it progresses by discovering new facts, solid, indisputable, often quantified, rather than by merely swapping arguments or opinions. By adding to our knowledge of the world through observation and experiment, science seems the leading edge of intellectual progress, indeed, the paradigm of progressive inquiry. And the overwhelming popularity of this image has been reinforced by the great and continued practical success of modern science, only confirming our faith in scientific method. But, paradoxically, as the general authority of science grows, the nature of science is questioned more and more as historians, sociologists and philosophers of science investigate its standing as objective knowledge and call into question its prized grasp of reality. It was developments within science itself which initially sparked these doubts. Einstein proved that not even Newton, the emperor of scientific truth for over two centuries, was wholly true. And Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, demonstrating that the very act of measuring particles changes them, shook physicists' confidence in their ability to observe and measure physical reality. And then philosophers of science, men like Sir Karl Popper, men who admire science and aim to put it upon the firmest possible foundation, formulated philosophies of science which appear to make huge concessions. Popper admitted, for example, that scientific method could never attain provably true knowledge, but only proffer conjectures as yet not proven to be false, what he called the principle of falsifiability. And going further than Popper, the physicist Thomas Kuhn has suggested that to a surprising extent, key scientific concepts, what he calls paradigms, have not been initially very satisfactorily grounded either in evidence or in deductive argument, and that dogma and speculation, rather than rationality, have been the motor of scientific change. And then, ideological critics of science have gone further still, rejecting the whole attempt to set science on a pedestal as a superior form of thinking. Are scientists really so interested in truth and method? Are they Karl Popper's in white coats? Or is science, as Paul Feyerabend cheerfully and anarchically suggests, a basically freewheeling business in which anything goes so long as it works? Don't we perhaps treat science with too much respect and awe? And perhaps we should not be thinking about truth and method in any case. There's a growing critique coming from Michel Foucault and the French post-structuralists and from numerous radical and Marxist writers, suggesting that instead we should think of the relationship between truth and power. We should consider science not as pure knowledge, uncovering natural laws in its long march to truth, but as historical constructs determined by real social pressures, research grants, state priorities, socio-economic interests. There's no single line of attack amongst these critics, rather a growing chorus of philosophical and political criticism. And one of the latest contributions to this growing debate comes in a major new work, Critique of Scientific Reason, by Professor Kurt Hübner. Hübner denies that science has unique access to an objective, real world of nature and therefore rejects any claims in privileging science over other forms of thought. With Professor Hübner, the philosopher of science from the University of Kiel in West Germany, is Bill Newton-Smith, author of the recent book The Rationality of Science, in which he calls for a temperate rationalism, a sophisticated yet confident belief in scientific claims to truth. And Bob Young, of the Radical Science Collective, and author of numerous works outlining a substantial Marxist critique of the priorities of contemporary science. Professor Hübner, you've called your book a critique of scientific rationality. What do you think it is about scientific rationality that is most in need of being criticized? Well, first of all, perhaps I should uh, explain the title. 
um, you know that Kant wrote his book a Critique of Pure Reason, and it is analogous because uh, I want a critique means some kind of an analysis, analysis of the method and of the basic conception of science. And so the, the principal point is that I think that science is not based on absolutely cogent experiences or absolutely cogent sentences which I can, are evident by reason, but uh, that is uh, uh, based on some uh, pre uh, preconditions and premises which itself are not provable by experience or by reason, but which are only explainable by history. Let's take, say, Copernicus and, and the, the revolution in astronomy which led mm -hmm. to heliocentricity mm -hmm. in the 16th century. Yes. Are you saying there that it's particular cultural biases yes. which Copernicus and his contemporaries had, yes. which would lead him to believe in a sun-centered universe, others to believe in an earth-centered universe. And it wasn't scientific discoveries, observations, etc., which were crucial in the swap. Yes, I think so. There was almost no experimental uh, test for the Copernican system. The only one thing in which he believed was that the theory should be simple. But what was the reason for this belief? Because he, he believed that God is a great engineer, who, who made these words as an engineer, that means reasonable, and, uh, which uh, people with reason can understand. So you can see in this case that the historic situation is the base of uh, this belief. So if you ask me why did they believe in this uh, theological or metaphysical conception, which, was, uh, which is in contradiction to, for example, the conception of the nominalists in the medieval age, so I, I can uh, say you frankly, nobody knows. It's impossible to, uh, to explain that. How can you, how can you explain that? Uh, if, you, if you analyze the, the scientific term or conception of explanation, there is no scientific explanation of this. You only can say, if they believed in the simplicity of the word by theological or metaphysical uh, uh, um, reasons, so the consequence would be that they are adherent of the Copernican system. Yes. But why is they believe in that? I can say. What, you, what you're saying seems to be very bad news for practicing scientists if you're suggesting that they, they in fact are not more rational than, than other people. What, what would you expect a, a scientist who listens to your arguments to conclude from them? Oh, I, I think he should not change his work at all. <laughs> so, so you're not actually anti-science in any sort of No, way. absolutely not. Absolutely not. I'm not anti-science. I only want to, to show that science is uh, not a thing which is absolutely uh, cogent, you know. The, the reason why I want to show this to uh, people is that I think in this scientific age, in this scientific age, perhaps I would, uh, should tell you that uh, when I was a young man, I was very impressed by Max Weber's um, uh, work uh, in which he said that, um, that science has brought some kind of a disenchantment of the world. Everything is very rationalized, everything is uh, sober, and uh, all these enchantments of means and religion uh, uh, we are missing now. So I think that uh, if we believe that science is more than the way to interpret the world, like other ways to interpret the world, if you think it is absolutely unavoidable that we see the world uh, in the light of science, then this, this, uh, this enchantment is really some kind of a destiny which we cannot change. So you're, you're suggesting that, that science is just one of many different ways of interpreting the world. No better, no worse? Uh, you, yeah, I think they are equal. If, uh, you, you, have, you have different uh, interpretations, like, uh, for example, uh, the interpretation in the antiquity and the Greek myths, for example, with the Christian religion and different other ones. Uh, this is an interpretation of the world. Uh, and a different interpretation. Of course, myth has no successes on, in those fields in which uh, science has successes, but it has success in other, in different other fields. Uh, so uh, this is incommensurable. You know, there are different dimensions, dimensions of reality, which are grasped by myth or by religion or by science. So that that sounds like a fairly comprehensive knocking of science off its pedestal. Bill Newton Smith, you're. 
a, a great defender of the, the rationality right. of science. Science has been knocked off its pedestal. Can it pick itself up off the floor, dust itself down and fight back? Oh, I think so. I um, think that the basic assumptions of science that you referred to can be justified. I don't think we have to resort to a merely historical approach. I think that most scientists are realists. They think that they're aiming at truth and they think that they're justified in their choice of theories. And I think that they're right in that. I think that that view is alive and well, and indeed this program can provide a lot of evidence for it. Let's think about a television receiver and think of the complex theories of the electron, the photon, that are assumed in the construction of it. Television sets work. And the realist, and I think most scientists, are inclined to argue that this is a pretty strong reason for thinking there's truth in those scientific theories that are used to construct something that works. Now, of course, some forms of realism have been too simplistic. If one simply says we're interested in truth and stops then, you run into difficulties defending science as rational because, as was pointed out, Newton's been shown to be false. In fact, any scientific theory will turn out to be false within, say, 200 years. So it wouldn't seem rational to aim at truth if we have good reason for thinking all theories in the end turn out to be false, strictly speaking. It's not rational to try and get to the moon by flapping your arms if you don't believe you can even get airborne doing that. So science wouldn't be rational if that was the goal stated so simplistically. But of course, what we should do is get a more sophisticated but truth-related goal and say that science is aiming at getting more approximately true theories. And once we specify the goal in that way, then I think that the realist is, is going to justify the basic assumptions of science and is going to be in a position to give an explanation of science. I mean, the most striking thing about science is what we've, I've remarked on the great predictive and manipulative success it provides. I mean, planes fly, computers work, televisions work. It would be a complete and utter mystery that this is so if it weren't for the fact that the theories used in constructing them are getting nearer the truth. Uh, I'm sure you know that success is something very good, but there's no proof for the truth. But it's evidence. Hmm? What is evidence? For what? Not for the truth. But because, wouldn't it be very... I will give you an example. Somebody sees a watch the first time mm -hmm. and he doesn't know how it functions. So he makes a theory. For mm -hmm. example, it functions with according to a mechanical laws. And he will have very good success with it. Mm -hmm. But it will be completely wrong if this is an electric uh, watch. Another example. A, a perhaps more important example. Take, you, you, you remembered uh, Einstein. Uh, Einstein himself said, it is quite possible that two theories may have the same success forever. So we can never can, uh, say if a success uh, proves the truth. And the reason is very simple. It's a logical reason. Because how uh, do we find out a success? Well, we have a theory. From this theory, we deduce what the scientists uh, call, or the philosophy of science, basic statements. The, these basic statements describe very simple observations. Uh, now, if these observations are in agreement with what we can observe, we say we have a proof for this, uh, or corroboration, that's the right word, for the theory. Okay, but, uh, uh, yeah, corroboration for the theory. Okay, this it means that we conclude from the conclusion to the premises, which is logically impossible. If the conclusion is is uh, uh, correct, so the premises could be false. So you can have a fantastic success also with with false premises. It means with a false theory. So that is the reason why never a success is a proof for the truth. But the, the clock example actually supports the the realist because the realist is just saying. You're aiming at getting some degree of truth. And if I've got a theory about a clock that works for mechanical clocks, then I've got some of the truth. Okay, it's broken down. If I've got a digital watch, I'll have to have another theory to cope with that. And I'll end up, at the end of the day, with a plurality of theor theories covering all cases. It is very strange if you have two theories which are really in contradiction, for example, to each oh, other. Oh, that's, that's shifting the ground. Yeah, that's a different... No, not at all. But because we are speaking now about the logical possibility that two 
uh, equal theories which are in contradiction. Oh, yeah, they if, have the same success forever. If there are two theories that are in contradiction, if, yeah. and if they make exactly the same predictions, yeah. I wouldn't be a realist about those two theories, but I'm not worried because no one has ever produced and proven that they've produced a rival to, say, quantum mechanics or a rival to, say, general theory of relativity, which makes exactly the same predictions in every circumstance. I can give you an, an, a very good example. For, uh, the Newtonian gravitation theory is in clear contradiction to the Einstein uh, uh, gravitation theory. In clear contradiction. Okay. So, you may say, for a long time, they were also practically equal. Success was the same, you know? So, uh, and Einstein, as I said already, believed that it is possible that never we can really uh, make a, a, a real difference between these two regarding the success. Okay, so if what happened, the one theory, I mean the Einstein theory, had uh, some predictions which the Newtonian Einstein uh, Newtonian theory did, 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 uh, could not give. Always, I can make an, an a correction of the Newtonian theory, mm -hmm. and you have again the same thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, you see that uh, in any case, logically, there is no absolute proof that the one is right and the other is false, or that there is even an approach. But this isn't very convincing because it will just get more and more complicated. And we also care about complexity in the choice of theories. The Newtonian theory will get more and more but complicated. It has nothing to do with complexity, it has to do with the fact that the conclusion from basic statements and singular observations to the truth of some general sentences, which uh, uh, are the basic statements of, a, statements of a theory, is never really possible. Oh, but this just shows that science is a risky business. You get, <laughs> you get some observations, and there might be more than one theory that fitted it. So you. You opt for one. You try and gather more data. And you may, the, the rational thing to do may be to keep the two theories in the field. The mere fact that there could be competitions and that there could be difficulties of resolving them doesn't count against the realist. The realist is quite at home with this view. In that situation, he'll just wait and see. He won't know which theory is the true one. Do we get more evidence in? I what I said, because I'm, you are operating on the level of praxis. And I oh, no, I, I, dis okay. I disagree entirely. I'm arguing from praxis to theory. I'm arguing that the success of praxis is the best explanation, is the reason for the but truth of the theory. It's the reason that why we believe in it. Yes. But it's not a, not a what, reason what, that what, it's what, true. But you can't believe in it without believing it to be true. That's what believing is. Bob Young here is the, the great uh, person who's interested in praxis, being a, a Marxist thinker about science. How do you make this debate out about scientific reality? Well, I've just been sitting here sort of controlling my anxiety and reminding myself that I have a degrees in all this, but I'm having trouble relating to it because I'm also thinking on behalf of myself as a viewer. Um, my first philosophy professor, uh, a man named Richard Rorty, uh, holds views which are relevant to all this, uh, especially views about uh, practice. The view of his that that I'm finding most striking right now is, is about proof, and, and he's, he's suggesting we introduce a new position into, into proof. There's sort of proven and not proven. But uh, he's introduced a new position called don't care, and, and that's my reaction to what I've been hearing so far. Um, and the reason is that if I ask myself, on behalf of us, when we're not being philosophers or historians or, or whatever we are here, what questions about science do we really want the answers to? Or what is it about science or science and technology or science, technology, medicine or expertise in general that matters? And I don't think anymore in the 20th century, I think maybe in the 16th and 17th century for a small number of people, the grounds of truth uh, really, really, really matter. But I think only professional philosophers of science, when you said scientists are realists, I think they're realists all right, they need grants, they're having their, their, their um, things cut, they have to hustle for jobs like everybody else these days, etc., etc. And the sorts of things I think matter to people is that, uh, that the queues in the National Health Service are too long, or that, uh, or that a child starves every 15 seconds in this world. And, and science holds itself up in, this, in the way that we've been speaking about, and we, we elevate it in quite important ways. But I'm no longer sure, and, and I'm really serious when I said I spent a long time studying these things, and so I can relate to this de debate part of myself. But another part of me says, why are we still sort of racking back from the microscope or from the fundamental particle or, or moving from questions about 
position and velocity of electrons out to, to questions about the meaning of science. Really, the meaning of science has something to do with the broader culture. And our examples so far have been for instances, like the cat is on the mat in philosophy. Whereas it seems to me there are questions like, what role is science playing in the culture? Do we live in a technocracy? Uh, what is it to separate facts from values, which isn't really happening, they're just certain values are being perceived and not spoken about. And I would, like, I would invite us to broaden the issue out, to say, what, what do you mean by the concept of myth? What, 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 what is it you're trying to put in? I thought I heard a, a sort of note of, of the relevance of the value systems and religion, maybe, in, what you're, in the expansion you're trying to make from science. I'd welcome that. Not, not, not that I'm a religious person, but I certainly think that, that, that science is value-laden, that all facts ha come from somebody's priority list, somebody's research and development uh, uh, set up, somebody wants to know something. Um, Einstein uh, doesn't come to my mind. Edison comes to my mind. The number of different things he tried to make his light bulb work thousands of them and he ransacked nature or when they wanted to have the atom bomb um, they were separating between two isotopes of uranium 235 and 238 I forgot which is the right one but they set up a whole huge project to find that out so in a way they were saying we'll do anything to get this result anything to get this answer now I can't think about science apart from who sets the priorities how badly do people want to know things what will be the effects of it and, and what are the purposes, the uses, the use values, the goals that are built into it? And I, and I picture you, and I say this with some respect, because I found you look very interesting. I picture you sort of working your way out of a traditional agenda in the philosophy of science to a lot of questions that lay people already know. They may not think about them in the way that we do, that we do but they're already asking these questions. You know, science is so important in our culture, how come it's such bad news? And I would invite us to try and think like that about I think I agree. I think I, I gave already a hint when I said that the motive for my book was rooted uh, in my youth when I, when I uh, read the book of uh, Weber mm -hmm. and uh, when I f uh, found out that uh, this, this absolutely scientific and technological work doesn't satisfy me. Mm -hmm. And I, I saw no chance to avoid it if it would be the absolute truth, you know, so there would be no chance. I would say, okay, this is the reality, it's uh, disenchanted, I can't really think, and we have to go on to, to work only in science and technology, but I think it is not necessary. Now the question arises, how, how think the other people about that? So you see, for example, in Germany, we have a movement, uh, which is called the Green Movement, I don't know if you know. So, uh, even if I don't sympathize uh, in any respect with these people, but I understand their motive. This is, I think, a very similar motive. They have the feeling that we have as much lost by this scientific culture as we have won. So this is what but I they're not asking themselves, they're not having a debate about realism or falsificationism or anarchism. They're no, actually trying to reconceptualize how we think about nature. Okay. And by the way, all of them aren't he's. I noticed that all philosophers okay, of science... Okay, but it is also are necessary. You, look, this is... I, I like can't, most of them are. I think, I think this is partly irrational. If, they, if people don't ask these questions, but are against science, you know. This is irrational because if they have not first found out if science is unavoidable because this is the real and natural truth, they have no right, to really, to protest. They have perhaps the right to protest against some results, you know. But it is a very superficial uh, uh, opposition. The real opposition should be, it should start with it, would be absolutely rational. If they also could say, and it is not the absolute truth. Isn't it a, a very a, a deeper point of view? You, 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 someone who's skeptical about the amount of money and resources we put into science does need to abandon realism. I mean, I don't, there needn't even be a conflict here. On the one hand, there's a theory about the nature of science, the nature of what a theory is, and what a scientist is trying to do when he aims at getting a good theory. One could raise the question, which I think you're raising, is saying, all right, there's an institution which has certain kinds of theories as its goal, in terms of which there are debates about realism and anti-realism. One can stand back and say, 
aren't we spending too much money on science? Wouldn't we be better off if we didn't do science? I mean, that seems to be the sort of question that you're raising. I don't think we should stop doing science. I just think we should stop conning ourselves into believing that values and politics aren't packed into people's agendas in science. Let me give you an example. I, in, in, in the 1930s, there was no uh, medical research council to give money. There was no in America, um, what it's called, National Institutes of Health, etc. If you wanted money, you had to get it from the Rockefeller Foundation in biology. The Rockefeller Foundation gave people grants on condition that they used the methods of physics to think about the life sciences. And that gave us molecular biology. You could have money for something that spun things around real fast in ultracentrifuge. Now, the realist put in a research proposal to get an ultracentrifuge. And I'm using realists in the, deliberately in a different sense yes, from the yes, way you're yes, using yes. And scientists get grants for doing things that somebody wants to give a grant for. Do you think that these... And that's about social priorities. Right. Do you think... Not about the philosophy of science. You said these values are packed into the agenda. Yeah. Are you saying they're packed in so intimately that the very criterion of what is a good theory for a given subject matter is dependent on these value assumptions? Are you saying there's no such thing as one theory being objectively better than another? It's only better relative to a system of values. Please don't think me rude. I don't care. And the reason I don't care is that it seems to me we have to reconceptualize how we ask questions. And I would like to ask questions in a rather old-fashioned way, in an Aristotelian way, so that it's never allowed to speak about something unless you're speaking about its purposes. Unless you are saying, for what purpose do I ask this All right, question? here, I'll give you, a, I want I'll to give come you a purpose. The other end. Yes? Here's the purpose is, is we would like theories that enable us to continue to predict and manipulate the physical world. Will the criteria that scientists use in pursuing that goal necessarily involve values? Or can they have objective criteria to follow in pursuit of those goals? Two answers. Yes, but you don't get a grant until everybody eats. They so you're all, you, are, you are agreeing that there are objective criteria? No, I th I'm sorry. I thought the yes was that unless the values are, are considered to be intrinsic. In, 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 my in one of your papers, you uh, wrote that, um, you call it ideological uh, preconditions. Okay, we could debate it, but let us uh, yes. uh, now. Uh, they are also constitutive for yes. the construction of scientific concepts. Yes, that's my view. So if they are constitutive, yes. uh, you cannot uh, divide here is science and here is uh, the question of power or right. po uh, political right. uh, uh, involvement right. and so on. You can't do that. So this is uh, something which... Uh, and this, uh, and I, I think we agree about that in yes, different words. I think, I, I, only, I think the only disagreement is uh, regarding uh, the... the, the, the uh, well, uh, well, the, um, the edge from which uh, from which you explain everything. You know, I, I, you have a special explanation why uh, what is constitutive. You think that this mostly the others are mostly economical uh, reasons. I, I agree also that uh, there are not of economical reasons, but I think there are also also different other. So do I. So do I. I would say cultural reasons in the broadest sense. Yes, of course. But if economic and social factors are playing this sort of role in theory choice, how do you explain the fact that the result of the interplay of those forces is that theories do get better at predicting? It wouldn't, isn't it sort of an, isn't it better to argue that there are objective principles that we have latched on to that give us some guidance, fallible but, guidance as to why? which theory is, is why better? Why do we want to do that? What is your... Well, I, let us, I, let's leave that question for a moment. Let's just... I mean, maybe we shouldn't want to do it, but the point of the fact is we have a history in which we've done it, and we want to understand what it is that's enabled us to do it. But that's and a history about the history of certainty. I can understand no, in a secularizing society why people wanted a concept of truth which was as sh uh, reassuring to them as religious truth was before. I really understand that project. I understand the project of 19th century positivism, which tried to have a, a religion of humanity coming out of getting your science right and so forth. What I don't understand is now, with science playing the profoundly ambivalent role it plays in our society, that we still have that project. It seems anachronistic. To but we don't even... All right, it. let's drop the notion of truth. We don't need it for this argument. All we need to do is notice that scientists make choices, the results of making those choices in the physical sciences has been a great increase in predictive power. We can, it would be Not too to much of a coincidence. Even nuclear holocaust. Oh, sure. You mustn't separate the, oh, I know, I'm saying at the end of the day, we might want, want to say we shouldn't be doing science. But just let's understand well, how it works. That's what the values teased out, so that you can talk about predictive power without talking about what you're trying to predict and make. Sure.
true. But that's, you agree. But that was that my you, okay, but, you, but you, we're question. not really disagreeing because you're saying there is this great predictive power and citing yes, another dramatic example. Yes, I am. Yes, so, and I'm saying and the I, fact that the prediction I don't want to make. The theory of choices couldn't have resulted largely from social and economic factors, from pleasing the church or pleasing the party or pleasing one's professor, because it would just be amazing if they had that those factors should have conspired together to give predictive power. Can I just say that so the predictive? There's a role for economic and social oh, factors, oh, but a more minimal. One. The predictive. No. Predictive power of nuclear physics would have never got off the ground. Is in perfectly normal. Nuclear physics in 1932, when they're making some really profound discoveries, is a great year for physics. It was at about as uh, present a discipline as Egyptology is today. So it's in the past few summers. Now, nowadays, we're faced with huge, the, the, the product of that. Huge grants and grants, huge machines, etc. Et and I was thinking last week about what on earth could I say in two weeks? I happen to be reading a new scientist and I got it wrong. And it says Britain may opt out of, of, of expensive nuclear mm. physics. We may just stop. It may be, and it says, and it says here, any change in that position would be a matter for the government. Now there is a dramatic example of something we wound up in the Manhattan Project yeah. and making the atom bomb and atoms for peace and, 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 and nuclear energy and size well be and all of that stuff which I want on the table and here somebody comes along and says well let's opt out. Uh, but aren't we all, we're all going to agree with you right off the bat because what you're trying to tell us now is that economic and social factors play a very play the crucial role in determining what projects we take on in science whether we go into nuclear energy whether we go into that molecular biology. Power that you're speaking about. No, no different there's a difference but once we've got the project underway i don't believe that in the scientific community when there's a decision as to which high energy theory to adopt social and economic factors play a role they don't play a role in theory choice that's because they, they got play a, bad a role case of false consciousness they, they play a role in setting up the projects they play a role uh, in... uh, i agree with you i never would like to stop any program in science and so on but i want to come you know, in I and would, please withdraw uh, it no it, it depends of, of course it could be that uh, i, I one could debate the results, for example, takes a very, very dangerous results in biology, in modern biology, biology and so on. But I want to come back to your point, you said that um, the basic concepts of um, science could not uh, be as successful as they are if they would be influenced by uh, cultural uh, things. Did you if, say that? The, if culture was the main determining factor, Wait, but right? it, How could it not be? It, it, Where do it, questions come from, for heaven's sake? Look, at from somewhere. Okay, very, what I mean is they, cultural let me, factors, let me, let me non scientific. Let's let, very, let, very let, simple. Okay, of course. Plato drops them from clouds. Yeah, no, let's not play, let's not play okay. games with the word okay. culture. I mean, I mean non scientific cultural factors. What is non scientific? For example, well, factors that have anything to do with the nature of theories, evidence. Excuse me, if Newton believes in God, being everywhere in this sensorium of the space and yeah. everywhere helping yeah. to uh, to uh, to uh, 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 making uh, uh, functioning the yeah. gravitational force because yeah. that's what he thought. Yeah, but that's not why we adopted his theory. It was because it worked. I no, but it, it was one of his reasons why he believed it's possible. It's possible. It was because really a justification for him. At this point, this is a very important issue. We should take a break. Come back to it later. We'll be back in a few moments. Welcome back. Something very interesting was emerging just before the break, the problem of objectivity. Bill Newton-Smith was defending it, Bob Young was saying, why should we care about it? Bill, why should we care about it? Well, I, I'll, I think there are three reasons at least. I'll start with them in, and give them in order of priority. First, it's perhaps not so important, it's just myself. I would like to understand science, and one wants to have a theory of science which raises questions as to whether science is aiming at truth or whether it's merely aiming at prediction, it raises questions about what is a good hypothesis. These are questions internal to the philosophy of science. Secondly, and more importantly, sometimes people reject science because they have a false view about science. They might be rejecting science because they've thought there's no such thing as scientific method. So let's have a correct view of science before we can assess whether we want or don't want to have science. But more importantly, I guess I'm interested in the question of objectivity in terms of the question, is it possible to have objectivity? Do we have objectivity in science? It seems to me the general question as to whether there's the possibility of objectivity, the possibility that there are principles which 
tell you whether one view or hypothesis is better than another given the evidence is of crucially importance and crucial importance to the position of someone like yourself because you want to advance your views as worthy of my attention and why should I pay attention to them unless you are advancing them as views which are supported by the evidence views for which there is objective grounds. If your views simply reflect your own social and economic positions in society, why should I take them seriously? I think it's important for you and for me to believe in objectivity. That's why I care about objectivity. You can't advance and justify any position without the presumption of the possibility of it. Otherwise, your position becomes, I think, sort of self-destruct. You're saying, um, here is my view, but you're undercutting the possibility of giving any reason for taking it seriously if you don't yourself believe in some form of objectivity. All the best discussions happen during the break. During the break, I said that uh, forced to a uh, forced to the wall, I'm a sophist. By which I mean that, uh, as they used to say, man, humanity is the measure of all things. What I would say to you is the reason that uh, that I, you should be persuaded by me is that I'm persuasive, that you believe me to be a good person, that what I have to say is just and wise, and will. Uh, will do more good for more people in ways that we can have a big, long debate about it, probably a very long debate. But I would believe, let me, I let you speak for two or three but minutes Wait, 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 uh, I believe that the debate that's happened about what is a veridical perception, which we could start at, shall we say, uh, 1790, should have its grant withdrawn. That is, we should no longer fund that project. And I believe that the argument you're making about objectivity is the heir to that project of John Locke's. Now, you're using objectivity here. You had said that you would try to persuade me that yes. more people right. would benefit from right. your approach than right. mine, but you're going to have to give reasons for thinking reasons. more. Reasons. And that's what all we mean by objectivity. No, we mean not. having reasons for, and that's what we care what about objectivity and science. What are doing getting to vote in this election? They're spending too much of their time in their labs. They're not finding out about the real problems in the world. What I'm trying to say is, why do we look to physics? for guidance in that matter. It we seems don't look to me a guidance in what to do. to do in the world. Oh, you must not have been here at the beginning of the discussion. We started out talking about the physicists, this and Heisenberg and Newton and even the uncertainty principle and so on. We're working our way out from a project that is inside science, aren't we? No, I don't Isn't think... is that I, what your books are about? Isn't I don't, that what the course you teach at Oxford? No, I don't think we're, we're looking to science to answer the questions that concern us like euthanasia, whether to deploy crews or not. I don't think we're looking to science to answer those questions. And I don't think anyone, I don't think Why? our viewers would yeah. think that science is coming in to answer those questions. Science. Why has Voice has put this program on? Let me ask you that, in your view. We want to understand the way science functions, the kinds of questions it can answer. Mm -hmm. And maybe to show the limits of science, that science isn't necessarily going to help us in answer to these questions, the questions that are concerning you. So you're in the business of persuading people not to take scientists seriously? No, I I'm, would be in favor of people being more reflexive about whether they really want to deploy as many resources in science. When I'm defending objectivity in science, that doesn't mean that I think we've got the right distribution of society's resources in the areas of science. We might very well all be better off if certain areas of science had not been developed in this century and the money deployed in other areas. Here's a question really emerging about the direction that science has been taking. Professor Hubner was saying before the break that all lines of free inquiry ought to be pursued, that there should be no denial of access to inquiry. Uh, would you like to elaborate on that? Well, well, could I summarize shortly what I understand by objectivity? I think objectivity is the same like intersubjectivity. It means something is objective because something objective. If intersubjectively, intuitively, people could agree to that. For example, two and two is four. So everybody could agree with that. It is objective because everybody is practically uh, forced to agree with that. Yes, and by intersubjectively, you simply mean amongst a group of, of like-minded people exactly. who are holding discourse with each other. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Is that... Uh, adequate to your worries about objectivity? <laughs> no, I think it's, our notion of objectivity is stronger than that. We do think a group of people could be agreed on a something and it'd be wrong. Moonies, I mean, for example. I, yeah, I don't think that general Government agreement ministers. is strong enough. When one talks about objectivity, I think we think that there are... Re that we are talking about some things being a reason for something, and we think it would be a reason even if the majority of people fail to see it. I think that's our notion of objectivity. If, if you see a reason, then this is uh, this, this, uh, this point from the if to the then. 
this is maybe cogent, but the if can never be, uh, this is just, just a fact that we uh, intersubjectively agree, for example, that uh, uh, everywhere are natural law laws. It is just a fact that we believe that. And I, I, later, perhaps, we can discuss the, the, the different cultures which lo don't believe that. Lots of the, the facts which are at the basis of our choice in science are often very choice. humble it's things. Good, it's a good word. They're things like the sky is black at night. Now, that's not dependent on any theory we've known for centuries. But it is not a scientific uh, sentence. But it is important in providing evidence for the expanding model of the universe that is dark at night. That explains it. Lots of the most dramatic observations in science are these very low-level things that don't depend on any highfalutin theory. When the early days of x-rays and things like that, it was just, my God, it's hot. It's the sort of thing that was important. And so I, I think we get ourselves going by observations that are relatively free of theory. I think and it isn't something we just say, that's something we agree on. We can explain it. I mean, we've got our theories have the nice feature of being able to explain why we get agreement. It's dark at night. So we don't just accept it. We, everyone s sees it. It's obvious to them that it's dark at night. But our theory also explains why we get agreement. It's not just agreement. It's agreement that's explained in terms of the theories we have. But if you need this fact as a scientific fact for, to explain or to prove a scientific theory, the content is something quite different. You have to, you you have to, you have to distinguish very simple facts like uh, your pullover is blue and scientific right. facts. Very, the one, one, very, very, excuse me. <laughs> and a different uh, fact like, for example, uh, there is a cloud of electrons. This is something uh, completely different, you know? And uh, so, uh, even, e even this, even this, is accepted as an objective fact by the but, physicists. But I don't think I agree. But suppose I did. Why don't I just say, all right? Ob theory contaminates observations. It's awfully hard to get observations that don't depend on theory. So what? I mean, why can't we just say we've got a package? I, yes, that's that's right. You, you, what you're doing yes. is choosing between alternative okay. theoretical frameworks that bring with them yeah, alternative ways simple. of describing observations and one just works better very coping with the world. If you say so the night is better. dark, the night is dark, right. you mean the astronomical night. No, but, but I mean, of course I mean, you mean. Uh, after seven, eight o'clock tonight. But this is, no, I mean, this I switched is off the lights, actually. Look, if you, uh, 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 perhaps uh, can you uh, explain the other way around. You can speak about the night in very different ways. It is always the same impression, but one time it may be the, the night of love, one time it may be uh, yes. the night of uh, uh, Uranus, uh, you know, the, the mythical, uh, mythical uh, god. Uh, one time it is just a concept uh, without any uh, mythological or, or religious implication. So uh, uh, this, is, this is a different object. You, uh, it is a different object. Oh, for, I agree. for example, if, if in, in fairy tales they talk about the wolf, you know, that is, a, that is not one wolf as an example of the concept of the wolf, but it is the wolf. And people see things that way, you know. So people with a completely different frame of reference, a completely different way of thinking, like for example in uh, mythical uh, cultures, they, they interpret from the beginning also simple things, completely different. And uh, you think that it is quite normal and uh, self-evident that the Dark Knight is just a physical uh, exp uh, physical uh, uh, statement. It is not. It is, it is already the way the modern uh, uh, beings living in the 20th century see it. Mm -hmm. So you're arguing for a plurality of true worlds or partially true worlds, is that which are a, a, a number of different ways of thinking are equally valid. You mean the myths on science and myths and yeah. science and religion and values? Okay, and okay. Uh, um, uh, perhaps I, I, I can explain, I can give you an answer by beginning with a short explanation what I mean by the different frames of reference. Uh, I think the base of all these different ways uh, of, uh, of interpretation of the world means take means now in science to, to, to uh, compare only these two are based on a special ontology it means on special very general opinions about things for example in science and everybody's influenced today in the way that so we share all these uh, ontological conviction of science in science one thinks that uh, the the objects 
uh, could be distinguished in completely material object and ideal object. For example, the physicist is uh, occupied only with absolutely uh, uh, only uh, material object. It means there is never a distinction between that. Everything is, ob is material and ideal together. Secondly, we always think that the, the connections between the relations between the objects are ruled by natural laws. And uh, if uh, we cannot explain something by natural laws, this is just a chance. In, in uh, myth, uh, uh, things are not ruled by, uh, by natural laws, but for example, by regularly behaving gods. For example, if they think that always when Prosepina is going to the hardest, winter comes, and when she comes back, uh, this is the time of spring and so on. So, uh, these are only very few examples uh, on, uh, regarding some special uh, and, uh, and very basic ontological conviction. So, my, according to my opinion, this is the frame with which the whole experience is organized. Everything is seen only in the light of these things. But never can we decide that the one is true and the, the other is false, because this is already the a priori um, uh, base on which we operate. Alternative thought worlds, does that seem to you an attractive proposition? Yes and no. I want to grant Professor Hübner the right to do that, but it isn't what interests me. Which is not to say that I don't want to be polite about it. I, I, I'm in the same problem I was at the, uh, earlier in the program, which is I just want to start from somewhere else. I want to get off this terrain. And I want to ask a whole set of different questions. And all these questions are on my list, but they have to be very far down them, frankly. And I want, the questions I'd like to start with is, uh, who's going to benefit from these questions, whatever questions they have to be, or this piece of research, or this uh, technological project, or this medical development, and uh, who's in charge? And how accessible is the process of origination of this idea to some kind of democratic input? And at what stage is it accountable? Or do we only learn about it after it's been so highly capitalized that uh, there's no stopping it? Then I want to look at scientific disciplines one at a time and say, oh, solid state physics, pure science, eh? Well, actually, technology drives this in a way that technology drives atomic physics. And to go the other way around, from society to science not from science working outwards to society. Then I want to set up uh, all sorts of agendas to say, well, maybe we shouldn't spend so much money on seismology. It really has to do with test ban treaties, all that money they're putting into seismology, doesn't it? Or oceanography. Uh, it's not really that we're so interested in plate tectonics. We're trying to find places to hide submarines. Or containerization. I want to give one more example. And all the distress there is about, I want to say, let's, let's talk about what our priorities are. Why isn't yeah. psychotherapy uh, okay. available on the can, National Health Service? Can I try a distinction on, on you? I'm not saying that science is a way to resolve the most deep-seated value conflicts. It's a tool that we can use and produces wonderful results and can produce horrible results. The crucial questions, and we might think the most profound questions, are the questions that I think you've been wanting to press on us as to whether we should continue to develop science if it's bringing with it the risk of nuclear hol holocaust and other worse things. So I'm not saying that science is the means to resolving those deep-seated value questions. Those deep-seated value questions are important. I simply want to defend science as given one of the things that humanity values it is a tremendously successful way of making progress towards one of the things we value, but unfortunately... Well, to what? I, to, wait, to watching television. Can I comment constructively on that, Ron? Because I would want to say, I have no quarrel with that, but, I, but ever since the 17th century, we've spoken about science as though values were extrinsic to it. We separated the material and efficient and formal causes from the final causes, to speak in Aristotelian language. That is, the purposes are somehow left out of all the workings of science. And my position boils down to saying, let us go ahead with that practice. It is a very fruitful practice. But never, 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 at any stage of the process, do we say value decisions, what this is for, who it's in aid of, how it's done, who's in charge, etc., etc., is outside. It's some question that you discuss outside the lab. Because as things now stand, they say, oh, you want to talk about that? Get out of the lab. That's not science. And I want that inside the lab. I want it inside the practice of science so that people who are, for example, in pressure groups, social responsibility groups, friends of the earth, whatever you want to say, aren't somehow outside of science and outside the philosophy of science, a third force they're considered because they think socially 
And I find it bizarre that the history, philosophy, and social studies of science is three groups of people. They should be one group of people, and the agitators should be in there with them. Yeah, I think the scientists should be faced with the question, what are the real benefits of this sort of research, and um, should we do it? What are the costs of At it? What stage? are the benefits? Yes. Now, I'm not saying that I would agree with you in particular cases that he should stop, but I think that that question should be asked. I think what I want to resist most strongly is the self-destructive sociological approach that would say that in the lab, when faced with a choice between two hypotheses, you might introduce into the debate in the choice of the hypothesis, in the choice as to which was the better yeah, hypothesis, the I agree which that. interest group, yes. and you know that there are But he doesn't like that. that. The problem doesn't present itself in that form. Saying, let, you know, let's ring up the British Society for Social Responsibility to see if this but, number's right. But it doesn't work like I don't think you have to justify every move in science by saying that there is some provable cost-benefit from doing it. I think it's part of our culture to carry on investigations, you know, in science, in philosophy, without always making that practical thing. And I think the institution would be worse off if we didn't do that, partly because we find these things too hard to assess. We don't know in all cases. But I agree with you, it is a relevant question that should be asked, and sometimes the answer must be, we shouldn't be doing this kind of science. Mr. Don't, don't always want to make it as, sound like anti-science for stopping research. I'm talking about, at every stage, the direction of research. The purpose, the point, the goal should be part of people's thinking at the bench. But I really want to come back to this fundamental question that Professor Huebner posed earlier, which is here we have science as a value system, myth, religion, morality, history, other ways of looking, and that there can be some sort of parity between them. They each have a potentially equal status. And I can't see how that's compatible, Bill Newton Smith, with your general view of an approximation towards scientific reality. No, I, I guess I don't see them on a par. I don't see what myth is supposed to be achieving us. I think that myth was basically a second-rate attempt to do science. People told mythological oh, stories he lives. as an attempt, a primitive attempt to give explanations, and I don't think there's any turning back. Uh, it's so no, I'll, it's not on a part. something yes. about uh, mm -hmm. the approach of Compton, you know, the, Look, the stages. If I say that having a special framework it's a condition that at all I can uh, ask questions, you know? Without that, I'm like blind without the, uh, my classes, you know? So if I have such a framework, this is a way to interpret reality. Now, if I interpret reality with this framework, reality will, will show like it looks in that light. For example, if I have green glasses, everything would look green. If I have red glasses, everything would look red. So the reality shows me how it looks if I look at it with green glasses. And this, in the deed, shows me something real. This is what I said when I said it is an absolute truth that if this is uh, um, um, uh, my premise, then this will be the conclusion. So this is really a, a signal, uh, information by the reality. Now, in this way, in one frame, I can approach more and more and more of this truth which is defined by this framework. In the other way, I can do the same. I also have a framework and can approach the truth. I agree that I sympathize very much with this high culture. And I think it is intolerable that we are, feel always so superior to these people. Yes. It is not true that this was a childhood and now we are the, this is the age of the grown people. It is absolutely not true. Uh, so I have a, a great reference, uh, rever reverence uh, regarding that. But of course I know that we can go back to, uh, to this age. I only think that in the future, uh, we, will not, we will not be so extremely fascinated by the science anymore. And what will come out at the end, nobody knows. Nobody knows. A wonderful point, <laughs> the, the inscrutability of the future to bring the program to a halt. I don't think we've proven the final truth. We haven't come to a conclusion about the rationality of science, but we've certainly proved we can have rational discussions about it. Thank you very much, gentlemen.